really struggling with where to put this sunset lamp because it looks a bit weird just in the background but then I can't I can't do the whole video like that I'm literally gonna go blind I just thought it made it a little bit nicer for the vibe so it is up I have actual notes for this video um, and I know I'm still gonna forget something which is kind of annoying, but that is okay. Hello, 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 hello. My name is Elise. I'm a second year sociology student at Durham University and I make uni vlogs and book videos and very, very occasionally art videos. There we go. Like I haven't done in two years, kind of occasionally. In my free time, I obsessively watch booktube content. I watch booktop too, but booktube is just like, I love it so much because it still makes me feel productive, you know? I'm like, I'm doing research. I'm doing research for my current reads and then there's like a stack that just aren't being read. I decided that I was gonna do monthly wrap-ups this year because I love watching monthly wrap-ups so much. And I thought it'd be a fun way to track what I'm reading. So I've written some reviews. That does look really cool in the sunset lamp. It actually makes, I need like a light balancer there or something. We're not that on my budget. We're gonna start off with the very first book I read in January in 2023, the very first one. This was actually a Christmas present for me and this was Adults by Emma Jane Unsworth. So in Adults, we are following Jenny. She's a well-off 30 something privileged white woman who genuinely believes that her life is the worst life ever. She is completely obsessed with social media, she's trying to manage her job as a columnist which is kind of up in the air constantly and she's also completely in love with her ex-boyfriend and cannot get over him. This book really really tries hard to be relatable and that didn't work for me but I think that that's because it's very much targeted towards a millennial style of humour. I did find this book quite amusing though and I think that that's because the formatting and the writing kind of worked for me in a way that the on the nose jokes didn't. Like the formatting and the writing were very self-aware of how awful of a main character Jenny is and that just made the whole thing a lot more bearable and enjoyable because you learn to root for Jenny even though you didn't necessarily like her or what she was doing to the people in her life. I think that you'd enjoy this book if you are of the millennial or older Gen Z kind of generations, if you enjoy flawed main characters and very complex relationships but also quippy social commentary that's kind of set against a background of Instagram, psychic mediums and gin based cocktails. Then I moved on to The Special Ones by M. Bailey. This was a reread for me, I read it a couple of years ago. So this follows the story of four teenagers who are trapped in a farmhouse completely cut off from the the rest of the world having to pretend that they are the reincarnated people from a photograph sat on their mantelpiece and that is kind of all I want to say about the plot because you kind of want to go in knowing nothing. So this is a young adult thriller, I don't really read a lot of thrillers, I'm not entirely sure what the age of the audience to the scariness ratio should be but this fits well in my head for what should be a young adult thriller, if that makes any sense. It's really suspenseful, it's really creepy, it's got those vibes that make you feel like you're never really safe when you're with the main character, but it's nothing massively groundbreaking. I really like that it touched on the way that the media and the public view true crime and how we kind of see it as something that we're entitled to, a story that we need to know what happens. And the victims are kind of held up as these martyrs, but also simultaneously completely dehumanized and disrespected. If you're in the mood for something fast paced, creepy, with a smidgen of social commentary and romance, but nothing too deep or dark, I think this one's for you. I then read Midnight for Charlie Bone by Jenny Nimmo. So this is a middle grade fantasy series that follows a boy who discovers his magic and gets sent to a special school but it's actually nothing like Harry Potter I cannot stress that enough the vibes are just so completely different I never really got into Harry Potter I did read them but it's much more wands and wizards and castles whereas Charlie Bone is more age-old family grievances and little tiny magical quirks and immortal cats that are actually flames I'm not gonna dwell on this one too much because I am gonna make a whole video on middle grade fantasy books I love the genre so much and it's so often reduced to just Harry Potter so I want to talk about this series in that one so we'll leave this mostly for that one like the special ones i think that charlie bone isn't massively groundbreaking it's not incredibly written it's not a stunning universe but it's good fun and it achieves everything it sets out to achieve so i just really like it and then i came back for my second term at university and i read the song of achilles by madeline miller i finally decided to pick this book up because it was hayley jean's january pick for her book club and i was so convinced that this was gonna pass me by basically just sort of go over my head i was never really a greek mythology obsessed child i know loads of people read percy jackson i never did i've just never really been interested in it this book blew me away absolutely blew me away i'm 
oh, I'm still reeling. Madeline Miller just has the most beautifully lyrical writing and that's what gets me. I've realised that I don't like over the top flowery writing, I find it really distracting from a story but lyrical writing just gets me. This just makes me want to be an English Lit student and analyse it because the symbolism in this book, oh my god, like the way that music and the lute was a metaphor for Achilles' innocence. Oh, It was literally so stunning. If you have the slightest interest in picking this book up, do so. That was me. I was sat there in the shop and I was like, mm, I don't know if it's for me. And a girl literally came up to me and was like, you need to get that book if you're thinking about it. And I was like, okay. I'm gonna trust you. My warning is that it does take a little while to get into, but when it gets going, oh, I just... Oh, oh. The next book I'm kind of annoyed at myself over because I broke my book buying ban for it. I broke my book buying ban. I was gonna show you this now, but I do actually need to update it because I bought the book today. I decided back in like mid-November, I think, that I wasn't gonna buy another book until I'd finished 50 books. So currently, this was my 50 books, I'm on 32, but I'm adding two books for every book I buy in the van. So, how many is that? So I've now got to read 64 books, which means that I've bought six books while being on my ban, which is not too bad. Like if I hadn't been on a ban, I probably would have bought more. That's really annoying. Cause I was above half and then I bought a book today and I'm not half. Oh. I'm picking that way. I broke my ban in the middle of January because I was in town and I had nothing to read and I wanted to have a bit of a read and I was like, go on, treat yourself. Have a little look in Waterstones, see what you fancy. And I picked out The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Maz. So in this book, we are following two different women that I can't, I can't remember the names. So we're following these two women and how their lives are interconnected with this Paris sanatorium for mentally ill women in the 1700s and 1800s. We have an older woman who's a nurse. She's been working there for a long, long time. She's got a lot of preconceived ideas about the women that come in. Then we have a younger woman who realizes that she can see ghosts she confines in a family member and they send her off so they don't have to deal with her to this Paris sanatorium. So we have this brilliant setup of what could be a fantastic ghost story against a background of a really misogynistic Parisian culture. And what we got was just the most bland, preachy, expositionary description of feminism that I've ever seen. Nothing really happens in this plot. Everything's just so matter of fact and she did this, she was shocked, oh my goodness, women have it harder these days. I originally rated this three stars because I did find it mildly enjoyable at the time and now I do not care about it in the slightest so it's now two stars but we're okay because we then moved on to another five star read and I read Wondersmith by Jessica Townsend. It's more middle grade fantasy so I'm gonna try not to talk about it too much because again this will be appearing in my later video but my obsession with this genre will never cease. This is book number two in the Nevermore series. We have Morrigan Crow who is a young girl who's swept away from her very boring life into the wonderful world of Nevermore where she lives in an ever-changing hotel. She's basically just having a wonderful time in this incredibly magical city. It's so immersive and wonderful, I just want to live in it. This is a wonderfully whimsical fantasy with such incredible world building and storylines that feel so much more ambitious and complex than your average children's novel. I just love this series so much and I need to read the next one. It's there, it's waiting for me. After reading Wondersmith, I then continued with the five star streak and I read The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. <sighs> I read Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell back in 2021. I really enjoyed it, but I didn't necessarily connect with the story that much. I thought her writing was beautiful. I just didn't really love the story. So The Marriage Portrait, when I was enjoying the story, was just perfect to me. This story opens with Lucrezia, who is the 16 year old wife of the 40 year old Duke of Ferrara. And she realizes at a dinner table that he is going to kill her. From there, we have a split time on perspective where we go back and look at Lucrezia in her childhood, in her early years of marriage, and then that's juxtaposed posed with her on this night where she's realized he's gonna kill her and she's desperately trying to escape her fate. Except we've just had a forward where the author tells us that she doesn't survive a year of marriage. This book has such a hopeless tone to it as a reader as you realize that she's never gonna get away, she's never gonna reach her full potential, but you're still rooting for her every step of the way. Reading the marriage portrait after the Mad Woman's Ball was brilliant because I could see a such better example of how feminist theory can be portrayed in literature in a way that isn't preachy, that it's so inherently 
necessary to the story. It just made me sit there and think about the complete number of women that have suffered at the hands of men throughout history and then their stories have just been stamped out. Beautifully written, wonderful storytelling and incredible depiction of the curse of womanhood. Now I'm going to talk about book 8 and 10 together because they're in the same series but I did read book 9 in between them obviously. This is The Wicked King and The Queen of Nothing which are the second two books in the Folk of the Air series that come after The Cruel Prince. The Folk of the Air series follows Jude who is just one of my favourite characters of all time and we watch her as a mortal struggling in the high courts of the fairy world. This book is very much marketed as enemies to lovers romance and there is that and it's good but that definitely takes a backseat to the fairy politics that this series is actually really about. Jude is just fearless, she is clever and cunning and she always has a trick up her sleeve but never in a way that makes it feel rushed or a matter of convenience. Holly Black is just really good at laying the groundwork for all of these theories and all of these twists and turns to when they come out they shock you but you go but this makes perfect sense. I found that this series got better and better as it went on when I read The Cruel Prince last year. I actually raised it three stars which is definitely a bit harsh but I did that because I found that 90% of it was just really set up and it was good set up but set up is kind of boring and that last 10% was so good and I was like oh yeah I know this series is going to be good and then for some reason I just put it down and didn't pick it up again until this year and because we'd already had that set up these books were so good. I gave The Wicked King four stars because I think that the pacing was a little bit off in the middle of it particularly. The Queen of Nothing I just thought was the perfect end to such a brilliant series. So the final book which isn't actually the final book I read in January because that was The Queen of Nothing but in between The Wicked King and The Queen of Nothing I read Goodbye to Berlin by Christopher Isherwood. I think that this is actually semi-autobiographical and it's also the inspiration for Cabaret the musical. Isherwood is acting as a cameraman into the lives of these people in 1930s Berlin. He's interacting with people from lots of different social classes, lots of different nationalities, and he's basically just giving us an insight into their perspectives and their lives. Now, I was mistaken because I thought that this was written like a couple of decades after World War II, but it was actually written in 1939, which means that all of these observations that Isherwood is making about polite Berlin society, it wasn't reflective, it was current and that added a whole other layer and I thought it was so brilliant like the fact that he was sat there in polite society with all of these rich people discussing politics and they were saying everyone's making a fuss about nothing we're all going to be fine I thought that was dramatic irony but it's not this is a very anecdotal story which lends itself to being quite varied in terms of content and for me that just meant that parts of the book were a lot more interesting than others. I did find it a bit slow at parts because of that, there were a couple of characters that I just wasn't that interested in so I was like come on pick up the pace. But overall I definitely do recommend this, it's such an interesting insight into 1930s Berlin society and Cabaret is a pretty cool musical. So those were the 10 different books that I read in January, overall I think that it was a really good reading month, there was literally one that I didn't enjoy, loads of 5 stars for my first month, I was really not expecting that. I really enjoyed most of what I read this month. I hope you've had a really nice day or are about to and I'm sure I will see you very shortly.